All right, hello, welcome people to our live session webinar training thingamajiggy. Um, my name is Craig Bentick. I will be the person doing the talking today and hopefully I'll give you guys some nice tips and maybe inspire you in some of your artistic creations. Um, <clears throat> about me, I'm a digital artist and game developer. I've been doing it for about 12 years. Um, I've worked at a bunch of different studios, uh, Pandemic, EA, Sega, um, that sort of deal. Um, primarily as an artist, but I now teach design as well as art for AIE. So, I'm looking forward to sharing my experience with you uh, with regard to things like terrain generation, um, specifically with World Machine, and uh, then we'll be applying your awesome creations in 3ds Max. Now, I'm aware that some of you probably won't have that installed or have access to it, that's fine. You can follow along with the rest of it and uh, you should be just fine. The principles are really what are important here today. Before we start in earnest, I'd like to mention that for our session, if you could make sure you're sort of seated comfortably, um, you can hear me okay. Um, be aware that if you feel like getting up and moving around, stretching your legs, that kind of a thing, don't worry about it. Do that, because your health is more important than listening to me rabbit on. Um, this session will be recorded and available for you to have a look at later on. Um, now, feel free to ask questions as I go. Um, Mike Koo, um, my lovely colleague here, will be taking down your questions as I go, and I'll try and answer those at the end of the session, assuming we have time. Um, I'm happy to answer pretty much any question you have, except anything related to the new Star Wars movie. Um, I'm allergic to spoilers, and I haven't even seen the trailer, so just please be kind. Don't put anything in there that's going to ruin my awesome time with that. So, let's get to talking about terrains. So, I will start my beautiful presentation over here, and let's see if we can switch. If the technology is going to be kind to us. Oh, look at that. That's pretty. Okay, so, uh, that's me. That's what we're doing. Um, now, we've all seen expansive and awe-inspiring worlds created for epic movies, stunning vistas in our video games, towering cliffs and imposing mountains that give our games a sense of scale, or root them in a real world, whether it's Earth-like or completely alien. But how are these images created? What's the process of conceiving and developing these natural-looking, believable backdrops and locations? Well, today, we'll go through the process of creating our own world, opening up the possibilities for your creativity to flow freely. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, if you have Max, that's great. If you don't have it or you're not familiar, don't worry. The principles will apply to any package that you really want to work with. So what are we going to cover today? All right. First, we're going to talk about height maps and general terrain concepts. We'll jump straight into World Machine and have a look at its user interface. Um, you will then create your first terrain following these simple steps. Uh, then we'll have a look at weathering it down and applying some kind of natural effects to it to make it feel a little bit more aged. Uh, and finally, we'll look at how we can export these terrains for use in an application like 3ds Max. And if we end up having time, maybe we can have a look at a game engine or two and see how we might be able to apply things there. I can't make that promise because we'll see how time treats us. But um, So once you're done, you'll be able to generate your own terrains beaten by the sands of time, verdant or lush, all ready for you to integrate into your artistic expressions, animations or games. So we're going to be working at a reasonable pace here. Um, so uh, I'll be focusing on the principles and... Um, yeah, why don't, why don't we jump in? We'll have a look at terrains themselves. Okay, so the terminology that I'm using here refer to terrains as specialized assets in game engines and VFX pipelines designed to provide natural looking geology with elevations, slopes, and erosion as seen in the real world. So creating exciting or believable backdrops is a powerful skill. Organic elements like this can take a really long time to create by hand. And being able to easily generate complex and realistic surroundings not only saves time in that development process, but it adds significant depth and polish to your projects. Okay. These terrains form the foundation of the world, the earth or ground that we 
um, can walk around and jump on. We can put things like buildings, grass and trees and stuff like that. Characters can move around on them. They can interact and populate that space. They can also give us an epic scale in, uh, in film. Uh, we've all seen things like The Hobbit and other films where these sweeping shots give us a real sense of this place and um, the natural geology of it, um, as well as all of the flora and fauna that, that live in that place. And it can be a really effective backdrop. They can also represent different natural phenomena. Things like snow, lava, dry deserts, all of that kind of thing, um, and even creating alien worlds. So we can kind of manipulate it to make a completely new world that our, um, you know, that the people playing the game or watching the movie can get into. All right. Terrains are driven by height maps. This is a really important concept to understand. I've tried to articulate it visually here. But ostensibly, a height map is a black and white or grey scale, meaning it has no colour, just tone changes, image that represents different height values using each pixel in the image using its grayscale value. So let's imagine that black is zero, and that would be the bottom of the deepest ocean, and white would be the tip of a mountain. This texture on the left hand side here represents some canyons that are kind of forking off and branching. And there's almost a sense in which we can kind of read it. It looks kind of noisy and weird and not terribly kind of um, driven or crafted. But once we apply it to our terrain, all of these really, really subtle differences between the black and the white all across those ranges lift all of that detail out and give us a really cool result. So that height map drives the elevation or the height of the terrain that we're working with. So how does that actually work? Well, in case you're not familiar, um, 3D geometry is made up of a set of components. These little triangles that you can see on this flat surface here are called vertices. Uh, singular is a vertex, plural is, uh, uh, you would say, vertices. That's a bugbear of mine in the industry when people say vertexes. There is no real such word as, well, there's also not a sentence like what I just said. There is no such thing as vertexes. Bugbear over, rant done. Each of these points are connected by an edge component and when a series of edges come together to form a closed section like we can see here, then a face or a polygon is generated in between them. So this is just a representation of that grid or lattice that we would, um, that we would be working with. Once we give that the height map, every vertex on this piece of geometry is going to be displaced vertically or pushed based upon the value of the corresponding pixel. When this gets laid flat on top of here, we can see the result over here. The black areas are very low and the white areas are the tips of the mountains. So this is very low detail, but we get a bit of an idea of how it actually works. So we need to somehow create a height map that looks awesome when we do this process of displacing it. The way we do that is to use something like World Machine. There are a number of different tools, things like Terragen or Vue or other applications like that. They're all totally valid. Um, but in this case, World Machine is a height map generation tool specifically created for detailed and natural looking terrains. It generates the height maps based upon your own layout designs and allows you to kind of craft them and design them in a way, but it also can give you kind of automatic results. Um, we can also do things like weather them down. And yeah, it's a really powerful tool and um, it's very exciting. So if you do not already have the free basic edition of World Machine, um, you can follow a link. I'm sure Mike will be kind enough to post it in the chat if you don't have it already, or you can simply Google World Machine and go to their download page. You can get the basic edition for free, um, but it does limit the resolution of your output. So the amount of detail you can have in it to 513 by 513. Um, that's going to be fine for what we need to do today, but uh, if you did want to go higher than that, you'd have to purchase the full version, which I don't think is tremendously expensive. I bought it a long time ago, and I can't remember how much I paid, but it's not, it's not ridiculous. If you really need it for a piece of work, maybe you can get the people who employ you to pay for it. That would be nice. You ready to go? Well, why don't we get started? Okay, so I'll get rid of this business here, and we will jump straight in. So once you've booted up World Machine, you'll be presented with the following user interface. Now, we'll take a quick tour of the UI. 
Um, the first thing that you probably want to understand with this is that World Machine is what we call node-based. What that essentially means is that in the same way that you would hook up a VCR for your parents or plug in a stereo and wire it up, we will have a series of nodes that do different things that manipulate our final result in some way. And we'll kind of connect them in a big chain using these input and output nodes. And we'll have these wires that can indicate where things are plugged in and essentially what the flow of our procedure is. Um, <clears throat> up the top here, we've got the standard menu bar. We don't need to worry about that too much at the moment, mainly for file saving and loading for our project and that kind of a thing. But next down, let's have a look at some really specific items along this toolbar here. First one I want to draw your attention to are the world extents and resolutions. When World Machine is talking about the extents, it ostensibly means the area of ground that you want to cover. So you could have a five by five kilometer piece of terrain, you could have 36 kilometers by 36 kilometers, and you would control that using your extents. And we'll come back to that in a minute. <clears throat> next one we don't need to worry about. The next one is actually a fun button, the randomized one. This can be fun if you're starting out to just click that button and it will present you with a completely different result. It'll change some of the, what we call the seed values, the random numbers that are generated to do things like this advanced purling. We can talk about that in a minute. Then we've got our different views. We've got our layout view, which will give us a top-down view of the, the procedural terrain extending off to infinity. Hello! And we'll use our right mouse button to pan around this view. And this shows us the extent. So we basically get a top-down view of what our terrain might look like from space. Um, then we've got a quasi 3D view of that. And then we finally got our 3D view. Now, this view and the node view, the device view, these are the two ones that you'll probably use the most. Um, we can hold down the left mouse button and orient around the terrain and have a look at it and see what it does. I mean, it already looks kind of cool and we haven't done anything yet. This is just the random template they give us. Next along here, let's have a look at these colored buttons here. Um, we have this green one called build. So what World Machine does is it, it lets you place down all of these nodes, but it doesn't bog you down in having to calculate the final result every single time <clears throat> that you want to make some change. In this view, we actually have a low resolution preview of what we're actually going to be working with. If we hit this build button, whoop, blink and we missed it, it was too fast. It brings up a window that shows you the status of each of the nodes being processed as you go through. We'll do some stuff to make that last longer, but suffice to say, that's the button you want to hit to actually calculate everything. Uh, and that'll be kind of our, we'll keep coming back to that when we've made changes and we want to have a look at a really more detailed result. Um, <clears throat> what else have we got here? The next toolbar down here is pretty important too. I'm going to be jumping around these a fair bit, so I might explain them as I go through them. But um, we have uh, the most important one we have at the moment is the generator one. And this is going to be the one that actually generates some initial information for us to use with our terrain, kind of some kind of values for it to use to drive what it's generating for us. We have a couple of different ones here, the layout generator and the advanced purlin. We have a normal purlin, things like being able to create a gradient or radial gradient, all that kind of great stuff. We're just going to focus on the advanced purlin and possibly the layout one. Um, so those will suffice for our purposes. Then we've got the outputs, and this will be used when we actually go to spit out our height map that I was talking about earlier. We'll hook everything up so that it can write that out for us properly, and we can use it in another application. Uh, some of these other ones are really cool, but um, we'll get to those if and when we need them. But the generator one is useful for you, and the output one is going to be critical for you to actually output things. Um, the other one to take note of is actually this macros tab. So that will allow us to load some uh, scripts that people in the community have made to do some extra cool stuff. And we'll definitely get to that. We'll definitely be using one of the macros that comes built in with World Machine later on. Um, what else do we need to have a look at? Um, oh, let's have a quick look at this world settings over here. So there looks like there's a little ruler with a mountain range next to it. And that's a pretty good indication of what this is going to do. If we open it up, it's got a bunch of information about those extents I was talking about before. This will allow us to change the width, 
of uh, the, the width and length of our terrain. So it says width and height, but it's actually the width and length of it uh, from a top down view. We can also change the resolution of the texture that we're eventually going to output. Now for your purposes, you'll be locked to this as a maximum resolution. For the purposes of the tutorial, I'm going to put it up one notch higher so that I get a little bit more detail because I feel fancy that way. Um, I feel special. Tiled build options, you don't need to worry about. That's to do with taking a larger area of terrain and spitting it out in multiple chunks so that you can do some other cool stuff with it in things like game engines and stuff like that. That's, you can explore that on your own if you'd like to. But in the general setup, we can adjust the vertical scale of our terrain. So right now, <clears throat> it's two and a half, around about two and a half kilometers. And that will be the same for you. Um, we're gonna leave that exactly as is because as I pointed out in the uh, slideshow at the start, our terrain is going to be exported as black to white values. So we can essentially kind of stretch those values to represent a different elevation in our game engine or our 3D package. So my tendency is to leave that as is for right now. So we'll hit OK. But in case you're wondering, this is where you can change the resolution, the width and height of your terrain. So the width and length really. Uh, and the, uh, the overall elevation of the terrain. Beautiful, okay. So the first thing that we're gonna do with this default world is select everything by clicking and dragging in here, and then we'll hit delete. Gives us a warning. Are you sure you wanna delete these three devices? This is something World Machine does that's a little bit different to other things. It checks if you're absolutely sure you wanna delete stuff. You can get around that by holding down shift when you delete, but otherwise you can just hit yes. So we're going to leave these little panels around so that we can, um, we can use those to our, to our benefit. I'll get rid of that one there. Terrain creation. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to create our first nodes. Uh, I've already adjusted my resolution to be a little bit higher, but just to recap, it's right there in the project settings up there. Um, we know how to delete our nodes. And let's go straight to the generator tab and have a look at some of our options. So we have a layout generator, a Perlin noise. So these are fractal patterns that are mathematical and procedural. Um, if you've used Photoshop, they have like a clouds filter that works in essentially the same way, but we get a lot more control over it in World Machine. Then they have the advanced Perlin. That's the one we're gonna use to start with. To place a node in our graph view here, We'll highlight it on that tab and then a little ghost of what, what the node is going to look like drops into our view and it's chasing our cursor around. We just hit the left mouse button, it'll plonk it down and it's actually going to allow us to continue plonking these down if we wanted to uh, until we click the right mouse button to deactivate that tool. So I'll grab those ones, shift, delete, I only need the one. One thing that you'll notice here is that you have a small preview window window over on the left hand side. If you hold down the right mouse button, you can spin that around and rotate and get a really quick kind of preview of what your terrain might look like. It's the same as if you hit this 3D view, it's just a lot smaller. Back in our graph view, um, the other thing we can do is actually drag this out. It doesn't make that little window larger, which annoys me. Um, but if we use the left mouse button, we're gonna move the sun around in that little preview. All right, cool, let's actually get to making something. Right, let's take our advanced Perlin and sit it over here. Let's double click it to open it up. Wow, this looks crazy. This looks complex. There's so many buttons here and knobs to twiddle with. Okay. The first thing here that you can pay attention to is the feature scale and they give you a pretty good idea of what this is going to do. Right now our scale is representing things like mountains. If we drag this slider down, observe on the left that we're getting much more densely packed detail. It's kind of getting very crusty as we scale the whole thing down. But if we push it past mountains and go up to continents, we still have the same level of detail but it's spreading the elevation of this fractal Perlin generator over a larger area. So I'm gonna leave it at mountains and that's well and good. We can do some other stuff like control the steepness of the terrain at this point as well, which is kind of cool, that's kind of fun. And 
The other ones you probably don't necessarily want to muck with right now. We're keeping things nice and basic. The thing that you'll probably want to do is use some of the presets that come with World Machine. If we drop this list down, we've got presets for things like canyons. And we can see in this preview that that's created a lot of high areas with some sort of deep crevices in them. Uh, and if we were to take the steepness down, we can see what effect that has there. So we can muck around with it. Uh, we've got a default one. We have an experimental basic purling. And if we scale the um, feature size down, we can get a little bit of a look at what effect that's going to have on our terrain. Stuff like Swiss cheese, which is actually kind of cool. It has lots of little potholes and craters in it. So that could be quite cool for a moon style environment. That actually might be a good one for us to use, truth told. Um, we've got a very fractal one, which we'll need to bring the feature size down to have a look at. It's very fractal. It's got lots of deep canyons in it and sort of flat areas and that kind of thing. That's quite cool. And then wrinkled, which if we scale it down a little bit, kind of looks a little bit like, I don't know, like spiky bits on top of an alp or something like that. So it would probably have a lot of rock in there. Um, but it also will have sort of grass and plains and stuff in it. It's a very slopey kind of terrain that we want to, that, that that gives us. So when you go to experiment with this stuff, if you don't know anything about geology, that's totally fine. I kind of don't really as well. I just know what I think looks cool. Um, and I continue to learn all the time through experimentation. So if you have some idea of like, okay, I want this to be a dry place. I want it to have lots of rocks. I want it to have lots of flat bits. Like, do some Google research. Like, look up different areas of the world that you think might have interesting geography to them and try and observe what you think they might be doing, what some of those features are. Play around with these presets and see if you can find something that, uh, that fits what you're after. For our purposes, I think I might go with the Swiss cheese one. Oh, uh, actually, no. I'm going to go wrinkled. All right. So we've selected that. And now we can see a little bit of a preview in here. And if we go to our 3D view, we can get a much more detailed look at it. All right. That's pretty cool. It's got a little area along here that we could, you know, have our character sitting in and sort of looking up this mountain. Maybe we just do a camera shot from here for an animation or something like that. Um, this is still giving us a low resolution representation of what this should look like. So if we hit the build button, it's going to have a think and we can see a few more features come in there and they look quite nice. So <clears throat> that's all well and good. What about if we want to manipulate this terrain in some way? There's a number of different ways that we can do that. The first one I want to explore is under this filter tab. So we'll hit that one <clears throat> and we'll have a look at some of the options. All right, we've got things like clamp, simple transform, terrace, curves, or we can add noise to it. We can do things like um, blur that uh, terrain as well. So if we wanted to use the overall shape of what we have now to drive another element in our node graph, because these can get really big and nested and crazy and stuff like that, we might want to do stuff like blur it. We might want to invert it. So we might want to take all of the black values and make those white values and just flip the whole thing on its head. So this canyon would become a ridge at the top. Let's have a crack at that. We'll click on invert and this behaves exactly the same way as any other node you want to put down in the graph view. We'll click on there. We'll right click to deactivate the tool. Now let's hook it up. So if we hover over the output pin of this advanced Perlin that we've created, we'll see it says primary output height field. Now it's important to um, be aware of what you're plugging into what. An inverter will take in a height field, so we're fine with that. We'll click on that once, and now the wire is stuck to our cursor. I've released the left mouse button. I want to hover over the primary input, and it says mixed. What that's telling us is that this could take in a height field grayscale input, something like this advanced Perlin, or it could take in a color input and invert that instead. So we'll, we'll deal in height fields and RGB colors at, at a certain point down the track. So if I click that there now and we highlight the inverter and we have a look at our world view, whoa, it's flipped the whole thing on its head. Now that low, low canyon is a high ridge. To visualize this a little bit better, I'm gonna right click on this node here 
Uh, sorry, I'm going to open it up. No, hang on. Why can't I adjust its preview? There we go. I'll right click on it and set device display hint. So this is going to let us choose whether at the moment in the preview we want to see the terrain or if we choose mask, it's just going to give us the grayscale output so we can actually see what that looks like. And uh, that's essentially we've got a height map now. So I'm going to jump back. I'm going to delete this inverter and under the filters, I'm going to choose Terrace. So this is basically the same as what they give you when you start World Machine, but we're going to do it manually. We'll plonk that in there, make sure we right click out of it. And I'm just putting it in the filters note area just because, you know, it keeps it, keeps it clean. And we'll hook the primary output for the height field into the Terrace. Now, if we highlight the Terrace view, wow, we can see a little bit of what it's done there. Uh, and we'll go into our high res one. And it's actually created flat edges, flat surfaces along the height, the elevation of our terrain. If I make that a little bit more high res, you can see that it's applied these plateaus to everything. So now we've got something that looks a little bit more like it might be in a desert or something like that, which is kind of cool where everything's kind of been eaten away. Um, we can access our nodes along the left hand side here in the 3D view. If I double click on Terrace, and I know that's the one that I want to use, some of the options we can muck around with, like the number of terraces that we want generated. If I take that down, we can end up with something like that and just have like two massive ridges there, which kind of look quite cool. And I like the fact that we're getting a little canyon for a person to wander through and some shifts in height. So there might be sand people up on that ridge up there and maybe a crashed ship up on top of the mountain that you have to get to. So thinking about the story that you want to tell with your terrain is a really powerful thing as well. Um, so we've got our pearl in, we've got our terrace, which is shaping it a little bit more. We're, we're sort of losing a little bit of the wrinkly detail there, but that's fine. It's just meant to be a starting point for us. We've got our terrace and hmm. Um, all right, let's, let's quickly jump to output. Let's say that we were happy with this now. How do we actually output this height map in some way? Well, if we go to the output tab, we've got a few options here. Now there's, there's two that are going to be of use to you. One is the bitmap output, and we can tell from the icon that it's nice and colored. So that's what we would use if we wanted to export a colored image from World Machine which we will be doing later on. The one that you want to use for the height field is the height output. And that's going to make sure that it exports a nice detailed grayscale image for us to use in our art package or our game engine. We'll click on that and place it down in our uh, graph view the same way we did everything else. And it really is as simple as connecting the output of the last node we want to have affect our terrain to the height output node. Let's examine the output options a little bit and we'll access their properties the same way we do every other node here by double clicking on it. And there's a whole bunch of options. You can choose which file format you actually want to write this out as. There's low precision formats, which are 8-bit, and those would be used for things like if we wanted to output a texture from this that said all right, certain areas of this are going to have trees on it. We have a number of methods we can use to select certain areas of the terrain and export those out as a mask or a height field so that we can use that to say only place trees on the flat surfaces of this plateau, only put grass on this area here and that sort of thing. And we can also use uh, this kind of method to determine how textures will be applied in a game engine. We can export individual masks of our terrain that say, here's where the dirt is, here's where the cliffs are, here's where the rocks are, here's where the grass is, that kind of a thing. We then have the high precision formats, which are the ones that we want to use if we're actually going to use the height field to displace the terrain. The basic difference is that the 8-bit format doesn't have as many, um, doesn't have as many numbers between zero and one in the terrain. It doesn't have as much precision, as many color values in between that black to white range. 
the high precision ones do they have like millions of colors so they're quite good for this I'm going to use PNG today that's a decent format that's widely used in game engines and, and uh, that sort of greatness um, so we'll use that the other option you would have if you need to work in a game engine like unity or unreal and in fact I think unreal takes PNGs you might want to choose this raw 16 format um, because unity will I think only take in a raw format file but we can cross that bridge if necessary this is going to be our output we've got our name up here we want to set it to something a little bit more useful so let's call it tutorial um, terrain underscore height and you can see I've got a ton of stuff in here so I'll just make it zero one underscore terrain height so it comes through we will save that now it actually hasn't saved the height field yet this is just setting up this node so that it's able to output properly to get it to write out we need to click this write output to disk when I do that it'll give me a message saying the world must be built which is what this green button does before you can export your terrain would you like to do so now I most certainly would it's been written successfully alright that's great so now we've got our height output set up that's fantastic but if we look at it our terrain is a little bit I don't really like these ridges here they're not really super exciting they're kind of too flat for me and I want them to do something a little bit more interesting so I'm going to jump into the natural tab and locate the first entry along there this little brown button for erosion let's grab that one and what we can do now rather than plonk it down in our graph and connect that pin to the erosion and then the output of the erosion to our height field output because we want to put it in between these two we can highlight the wire that already exists between them click that and it'll automatically pass that through so I'm going to go to views and open an additional window here just so that we can see this a little bit better it's opened up on my second monitor I'm going to switch this to the 3d view because I find this a lot more a lot more handy dandy and useful let's put it up here so you can see what's going on a bit better come on come on give me the there we go we got the resize let's open up these properties I'll get a slightly better view of it and we can look at the terrace and then if we highlight the erosion we can see that it's actually taking material from the high points and actually carving out the terrain and making it deposit material from certain areas into other ones so if I hit the preview button it's going to take a while to think about it because it's got some heavy lifting to do um, no and it doesn't look as cool as I thought so let's go into our erosion one there's a bunch of different settings that we can muck around with but let's just play with the presets we've got a flood of slurry and that looks like it's doing some cool stuff classic world machine plus power uh, classic erosion let's go with classic erosion and see what that does we'll hit the preview button oh it's thinking 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 so you'll find as you add more of these modifiers to the terrain it'll take a little bit longer to think about stuff so that's done a little bit of stuff let's kind of go really crazy with it um, something that's really gonna muck with the terrain a lot cool erosion number two full strength good with terraces that should be good all right so this geological time enhancement is basically a, a multiplier so if we set that to like negative one or set it basically to zero it's going to have a basic effect but we can add millions and millions and millions of years worth of erosion to this terrain uh, to get a more pleasing and interesting result so we've got our low res preview here we'll hit that button there and it'll it'll think hard it's got to do millions of years worth of matter deposition look at that it's taken those big flat terraces along there and worn them all down and that looks quite cool I quite like that so now that we've built that we can open up our height output and write it to disk beautiful that's nice and good so we know that we have a file there that represents this height map at its proper resolution and all that good stuff now I hear you ask that's all well and good but it doesn't look great it's kind of just brown and green and stuff well there's a way around that and that is by adding a macro so when you open world machine you won't have this stuff here you'll need to actually load the macro that we're going to use 
So you click on the little folder button here on the left and they've got a big list of things in the library. The one that we're going to use today is under surface maps, basic coverage. And we want to tick that and hit update checked items to toolbar. Now what that's going to do is it's going to replace everything that you currently have in that toolbar, which is a bit of a pain. They haven't fixed that in years, but we only need this particular one. What are we going to do? We're going to grab this and rather than stick it in between the erosion and the height output, this is going to be an RGB or color texture that we want to output. So rather than have it follow this flow all the way to our height field, we want to put it outside of that, plonk it down and plug in the height field itself. Once we've done that and we highlight that one, we go to our 3D view, it's giving us a flat texture representation of what our terrain is going to look like, what the colors are going to be. If we open up the basic coverage uh, modifier over here, that's the same as our node, we can actually go through some of their presets, Pacific Northwest, snowy dusting, sandy desert. That's pretty cool. What about, uh, we might do snowy dusting. We can do things like adjust the height cutoff for certain elements of it. We can also adjust the slope. So areas where it's more or less steep will have a different effect. They will take on things like rock and sand and things like that based upon the slope of the terrain. So we'll leave that like that and we'll hit the build button. And look, it looks pretty sweet. It looks pretty cool. It's capturing all of those beautiful details of the terrain where it's been eroded away. But we can augment this even further. If we have a look at the basic coverage node that we put down, we'll see that there's a second input, which is called erosion input, and it's looking for a height field. So this is looking for a black and white output from our erosion. We have a couple of options. There is a flow map, which shows where matter has flown over time as water, wind, and uh, you know sand and things like that have eaten away at the surface of the terrain. Where has it actually traveled? Where has it gone? Where has it dropped down? We also have the wear map, which shows where that matter has actually come from, where it's been broken away, where the wind has beaten matter out of the, out of the rocks. Uh, and then we finally have the deposition map, which is where all of that matter and sand and stuff like that actually ended up at the end of all of that erosion. These two are really cool, but the one that looks the coolest is the flow map. So I'm going to take that output and stick it into the erosion input for the height field. We'll highlight that, go back and have a look at it, and me, oh my, that is much cooler. It's like a crazy spider web. And we can almost read that the matter has come down from these high points and traveled through all these crevices and flown down into this canyon, giving it a really interesting, cool look. If we want to actually preview what this basic coverage, this texture that we're generating would look like on the terrain, we can use a different output filter. Switching to the output tab, the first thing we want to do is make sure we output it. So we'll click on a bitmap output, plonk that one in there, grab the coverage texture, plug that straight in. We'll double click on it. And this one represents slightly differently, but in this case, we will select PNG 16 bits again. We'll specify the output file and we'll call it our tutorial terrain. And let's call it underscore color. We will write the output to disk. Oh, we got to build it. Yes, we want to do that. Okay, brilliant. Now, if we want to preview this, World Machine has a really cool node called Overlay View, where we can take the texture that's been output and overlay that over the top of the height field. So I'm going to take the erosion primary output that we're currently sending to our height output and also plug that into the primary input height field of our overlay view. And what you can see here is that we can have multiple wires coming off the same node. So we can branch things off and have them point to different things. We're really just interested in what this output is. And then from our coverage macro, we'll plug that into the overlay view, select it, go into our 3D view, and we'll hit build. And look at that. We've got some luscious, lovely, snowy looking eroded terrain. 
which is just nice and pretty. Brilliant. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to cover within World Machine. I think we'll jump to exporting and I'm going to keep that one very quick because we'll quickly run out of time if I don't. Uh, for the purposes of this example, I'm going to assume that <clears throat> you have a basic familiarity with 3D modeling and a 3D art package. I'm using 3ds Max, but you can do this in pretty much any art package you want. The important thing is the height field and the texture that you want to apply to it. So I'm going to create a flat plane and I'll turn my grid off and I'll maximize this view. And if I go to my wireframe, we can see that it kind of looks like the grid that I had in my uh, image in the slideshow. So this has a very low level of detail. We'll address that in a minute. At the moment, I'm going to navigate to my documents, if I can find them, find where I exported my height map to, and I'm simply going to drag the height map onto this object, and we can see it applied all nice and good. I'm gonna use my material editor, because this is applied a material to this object, to select it so I can muck around with it. Don't worry if you're not following this part, I'm just trying to show you the result. And I'm dragging that onto the displacement and I'm going to disable it. And then I'm going to take my color map and plonk that on the diffuse channel. So now I've got my color on there. What I need to do is somehow displace this terrain. This thing here is a misnomer, that's doing it in the renderer. I actually want to displace the geometry in my scene. So with this object selected, my plane, I'm going to open up my modifier list. This lets me do things like edit the polys, uh, optimize it, apply symmetry, all great stuff like that. This is an incredibly powerful part of Max and a huge part of modeling with it. All I'm interested in is this displace modifier. It's looking for a map to use for the height. So I'm going to drag this one over to the map make it an instance so if I make changes to it I can. The next thing I'm going to do is apply a UV map to this. Now it already has mapping but I need to make a very slight change to it. I want to scale it up just the tiniest tiniest little bit otherwise we'll get sharp jagged edges on the edges of our terrain and I don't want that for this uh, demonstration. In the displace I'm going to click use existing mapping and I should be ready to go. I'm going to tick luminance center and I'm going to start dragging the strength up. And you can see that it's already working. I've got a beautiful looking representation of my terrain with no polys in it. So I could go back and adjust things like the length segments of this object. So the terrain you end up with is only going to be as detailed as the polys that you throw at it, the faces that you give it. So I've made it 8x8 eight eight, and then I'm going to apply a subdivision to it, which is basically going to take every face here and split that into four. So I will find the turbo smooth is good. So you can see if I turn that off, it's split everything by half. And because I'm doing that before I displace the terrain, it's giving it more vertices to work with when it displaces it. So if I start to turn the iterations up to something really crazy, and we can see how crazy that wireframe is, Boom! I've got essentially the same representation that I had in World Machine, but this time I've got it in my art package. So let's do something crazy like throw in a daylight system. Yes, I want to turn that on. I want to throw this in there. Okay. Oh, so it's a daisy. I want to add a daylight system to it. Give it to me. There we go. Why you be like that for? Hey, come back. Come back here. All right. Let's put that in there. All right. That's better. We will set it to mental ray sun and mental ray sky. Yes, I want to do that thing that you asked me to do. And I will go into this modifier. Basically, I can change the time of day. So if I wanted it to be kind of early in the morning, that's kind of cool. I can use the north direction to kind of rotate it around and get a nice effect on my terrains. And then let's say I go in here and make mental ray my renderer. This is, this is not stuff that I'm trying to show you at the moment. I'm just trying to make it look good. I'll render a preview of it. That looks okay. And 
what it's thinking. There we go. Rendering. Okay. Mental ray. Render preview. Come on, do it. 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 Yep. 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 Boom. I'm going to turn the exposure down a little bit so it looks a bit cooler. Set this to something pretty high, like let's do an HD 1920 by 1080 or 1280 by 720 is fine. And we'll render that and we'll see what it looks like. Wow, that's a bright sky. I may have tweaked the exposure a little bit too much. Oh, but as you can see, we've got a nicely detailed terrain with a pretty quick lighting solution in our art package in just a few minutes. So that is a basic workflow, a primer on how to create some interesting terrain, get yourself a height map, get yourself a texture, bring it into your art package and do a quick render of it and uh, possibly integrate it into the rest of your work. So um, what I will probably do is um, wrap things up there. So, you know, let's, let's recap on what you guys have learnt today. We've covered the creation of basic terrain, adjusting its size and features to suit our needs, applying modifiers like erosion to create believable, natural, geological shapes and effects. Just as importantly, we've learnt how we can provide an asset that can be used in an art package or a game engine um, to be built upon and used as a basis for our world. This is really scratching the surface and I hope you all get stuck in and see just how far you can go with this tool. The artistic possibilities are really, really kind of unlimited. Um, and as we move forward and you practice these tools, I'd like you all to think about your terrains in terms of natural history. What types of weather have affected this world? Is it very dry? Is it rich with minerals or a swampy, mushy mess? What effect would that have on the topography of that area? So these ideas are going to serve you well in terms of thinking about the story that your terrain can tell uh, and create worlds that feel lived in and suit the purpose of your project. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll start answering questions now but if you'd like more information about AIE Online um, Michael will be kind enough to furnish you with the details or you can take down some of the information on screen now. Ooh, Ooh I think I must have cut out then. Um, I don't know what people missed. Mike if you want to let me know I was just talking about um, what we've achieved today and how to get in touch with AIE if you're interested in these materials and learning about this and mega 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 cool stuff that you can do in visual effects, animation and gaming. So uh, I'm ready to take some questions with our last sort of few minutes. If people want to throw them up, if Michael's got some, he'll send them to me over Skype because I can't actually see your chat right now. So yeah, um, I'll just I'll just get some of those those questions in just a second. Yes, yes, yes. I think that that will probably be a good thing. And let's see what have we got in the chat. I'll see what I can find. Um, this live stream should be recorded. Yes, that is an answer. Um, I haven't seen a tutorial bridging the gap between making it and putting it into an engine. Oh my goodness gracious me, if people are interested in that, I can probably show you uh, reasonably quickly. Um, while Michael's getting the questions ready for me, um, I will probably um, boot that up in the background. I'll probably show you with Unity, I think, might be a smart move. And da -da 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 -dum. Da -da 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 uh, let me slide back and see. Link to world maps in the description. And people love it. I'm on a Star Wars. Ah, nice, nice. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm just going to load this up. I'll switch back to my screen share when I've got something worth having a look at, to be honest. Um, actually, that's probably now. One quick modification that we might need to make to our work inside of World Machine is the way that we're outputting the height for our terrain. As I mentioned before, there will be certain circumstances where you will need raw files. So if I open up the height output that I've been using at the moment. Um, okay, so um, as far as exporting uh, this 
to something like a game engine. You certainly could do that, but the high resolution of the mesh would mean that it probably wouldn't perform very well. Game engines, modern ones anyway, like Unity and Unreal and CryEngine and that sort of thing, prefer to take in the height map that we exported because what they can do then is sort of logically work out how far the player can see and dynamically, we call it tessellation, but this turbo smooth that I'm applying, it would be able to apply it to a little circle around the player that they need to see the most detail. But as it got further away from the player, it would go back to something more like, uh, you know, more like that. Um, it would still look just as good, but it's off in the distance. So that would be all, all nice and good. Um, it's better to let the engine handle that stuff because they're smarter about it and just give them the height map. You could, however, that being said, take a low poly version like this and export it as a static mesh to be used in the background of a scene. If you need some mountain ranges in the far distance, you would be able to get away with stuff like this for that. So that's how you would do that. Um, now, I was just mentioning that in World Machine, in order to output to Unity, we need to switch our output from PNG to RAW, <coughs> pardon me, RAW 16. Then we'll write that output to disk. That's all well and good. And there's another little step there that we need to do, which is to take the file name of that and just rename it from R16 to RAW, R-A-W. Otherwise, Unity's not gonna like it. So we've done that and we'll cancel out of there. We'll jump back into Unitar. And um, what was another variation to World Map Editor? Uh, if you're talking about an alternative to World Machine, another tremendously popular one is TerraGen. And uh, GeoControl is another one. And an application called View, V-U-E, is another really powerful one that a lot of people use. Um, those can generate height maps as well, and they have their own very unique, awesome points. How long does, how does lodding work? So uh, if we're talking about lodding, that's level of detail. Um, the engines generally handle that with the terrain. So as I was saying, the area around the player is going to be more dense with geometry. It's going to all use exactly the same height map but it's going to just focus on the area where you are and keep that detailed and, and dynamically um, lod out things in the distance. So now that I'm back in, uh, I'm in Unity here, I can just jump up here and create a 3D object and we'll give it a terrain. And that plonks one into my scene, which is just a flat plane. Uh, so that's all nice and good. And really all we need to do is jump over to this control button on the right hand side of this tool, scroll down to the bottom and under height map, we can import raw. So if I navigate to where my documents were, my world machine documents, and I've got tutorial terrain height raw, I open it. Now, this is pay attention here because Unity is just weird in certain ways. Your settings might be different, but if this byte order is set to Mac, it'll look totally janky. It'll look noisy and messed up. So just make sure that you set it to Windows and you can just then hit import. Well, well, well. All right. So we can see that that's brought my terrain in and it's looking nice and lovely. Now, <laughs> the height is a little bit uh, not great. So we can modify that under the resolution terrain height. We'll set that to 200 and it will bring everything down. And we've got our nice, beautiful, beautiful terrain. Now I'm definitely not going to have time to go through setting up the materials for the terrain in here because when you do it in a game engine, um, you will use tiling textures that apply to very small areas. So you'll have a section, you'll have a small texture that represents cracked dirt, another one that looks like a bit of cliff, another one that might look like grass or something like that. And rather than having, as we do in Max here, one gigantic texture that covers the whole terrain, 
that would not have sufficient resolution for the size of a player to sort of stand there and see it in that way. Um, what we'd need to do in that case is what I was talking about before, where we would basically be able to extract the different layers from this uh, coverage that we applied. So bits where rock go, bits where the flow uh, of the erosion has gone, bits where snow lives, and export those as their own black and white textures that will apply to the terrain, but drive those smaller textures. I hope that that makes sense. So that's how we'd bring it into Unity. And I think you hopefully might be able to see We've got a certain level of detail on our terrain over here. If I can put a wireframe on here, it seems to be applying the same tessellation. There you go. All right. So you see right there in front of me, I hope you guys can see this line right here is where it goes from having this level of detail right at my feet to going to half the detail. So it's gone from having two faces for this area to having, uh, to having one. And then further away, we can see it goes from having two to having one there. And all the way back, we can actually see those seams where it's dynamically working out how much detail it needs to represent. And if I start moving, you'll see that all of the ones in the distance start to pop a little bit. They're dynamically adjusting their level of detail so that they look good when I'm standing right there. But if I move further away, here is much lower detail than if I happen to be standing right on top of it. So that is uh, pretty, that's pretty much, I mean, I suppose I could potentially show in Unity. Um, okay, well, uh, let's see if there are any other questions. Yeah, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we have a crack in Unreal? Let's see what that looks like. Just, just for the heck of it. Because uh, unless there are any um, other questions, I'm going to use the last three minutes to show the exact same process we did in Unity inside of Unreal. But it might go completely pear-shaped and I uh, fall off on the dismount of this entire presentation. You know, everything's going well and then in the last three minutes I absolutely fall flat on my face. I hope that's not going to happen. Once more, I'm just going to bring up those contact details for uh, AIE if you're interested in more information. Mike will be happy to help you out, pester him with questions and make his life more interesting. And by interesting, I mean busy and make him mad at me. Um, oh, now it wants to update. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So we're back. Um, no, not the intro screen share. I'm going to create a new first person project. I'm going to make it, uh, why not? Maximum quality, call it terrain. How quick can you do this, Craig? Can you do it so quickly that it doesn't really help anyone? No, I'm going to make sure you guys get this. My old computer is grinding. It's, it's groaning at me. That's one thing you'll definitely want if you want to get into games development or visual effects or animation is a reasonably decent computer because there's nothing worse than trying to articulate a vision or build something creative and being hamstrung by the hardware that you have you know the technology, the technology is there for you. It just doesn't seem to want to cooperate. Come on, Unreal. Don't be a jerk. Oh, this bloomin' launcher. There we go. Come on. Do it. Do it, do it. All right, we're good. Okay, cool. We're going to create a new level. I'm not even going to explain what Unreal is or how it works. I'm just going to go straight to the landscape. They call this landscape. Another landscape. I can either create a new one and use some really awesome sculpting tools within Unreal to change the elevation of my terrain, or I can just import the file. So if I click the open button here, and let me navigate to where my documents were, and let's use the tutorial terrain height. We'll open that one up, and it's already giving me a preview of what the terrain will look like, what its height values are. I'll hit import, and there we go. We'll just um, build the lighting only and we'll get rid of those black lines. It's thinking about it, but we have essentially the same thing going on in Unreal. Same terrain has come through. And if I locate my player start, this is the cool thing. Oh, let's frame it up. Let's find him. 
All right, let's move him down there and put him on the ground. And we'll go over here and put him on the ground. If we hit play, boom. I'm in my game. I can run around on my terrain and it's massive. This is like a super quick way to create, you know, a world. This could be an entirely, you know, alien world and I can walk up some of these slopes and explore it. Maybe there's a, there's a monster down there. Boom. Take that monster. I don't like you or you stupid face. I'm going over this other way. Yay. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the point at which I should probably stop when I start making sound effects for the game myself rather than um, letting the game do it for me. Thank you very much for your attendance. I hope that you found this illuminating or interesting. And I very much look forward to some feedback. If you have it, let Mike know how this went. If you want to see more things like this, AIE would you know, be really keen to do more things like this. Um, I'll have another stream next week on Thursday looking a li little bit more in depth with Unreal and creating your first game prototype. So if people are interested in that, feel free to check it out. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Bye.